Um, Dr. Stanley is the director of the Suicide Prevention Training Implementation and Evaluation Program um, at New York State Psychiatric Institute. She's a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and a visiting professor at the University of Oslo. Um, so we're very pleased to have her with us today. I'll give you Dr. Stanley. Thank you very much for inviting me um, to speak today. Um, so I just want to put up um, my um, disclosure, which is my, mostly my funding sources here. Um, and um, I want to start with um, what are the goals of my presentation. Um, first of all, I'll talk a little bit about suicide as a problem, but in particular, suicide um, as a problem in borderline personality disorder. Um, and what are some novel approaches to understanding suicidal behavior? What are strategies that we have developed in working with suicidal individuals? Uh, and I just want to say that in my presentation today, I'm going to really focus on the clinical side of things as opposed to presenting research data. Um, I have, I wear, well, actually now three hats, um, but the you know, mostly I think of myself as a researcher, but I'm also a clinician, and I've worked with suicidal individuals, particularly suicidal individuals with borderline personality disorder for many, many years. Um, and so uh, while I draw on both the research side and the clinical side, I really want to kind of focus on um, the clinical side of things. With that said, I'm going to talk about some data in the beginning. So one thing I'm going to point out here to you is um, that um, earlier it was mentioned, this is the funding for borderline personality disorder. Well, I'm a borderline personality disorder, but I'm also a suicide researcher. And really down at the bottom of the barrel here is suicide research. So if you are a researcher on suicidal behavior in borderline personality disorder, you're really in trouble. Um, and, um, and so if you compare it to, um, for example, and this is what, um, uh, what people have been talking about earlier about signing that petition and becoming a, an advocacy group, I think it's incredibly important because look at what has happened with autism. And um, this is a population that has been very, very active in, in demanding um, that research be done and that funds be devoted. And so you, it, it is possible to increase the amount of funding. So that's my pitch. Um, okay, so suicide um, has taken um, um, a, a lot of time in the press over the last few years. Um, and um, so I've been in the field for a really long time. And, um, and this was what it looked like. And so this is really why it's really important to not assume kind of causality. So over these years, what happened here was there was the introduction of, um, of SSRIs. And so everybody thought, oh, look, we have the suicide problem licked. Suicide rate is going down. We have these great new antidepressants. And then, as everybody else has presented today already, the suicide rate has gone up. Um, OK. Um, so, oops, I'm sorry. Um, so what I want to point out here is that um, over the last several years, of the 10 leading causes of death, of which suicide is one, the, the numbers of those people who die by those leading causes has gone down in every single one, or has at least stayed the same, except in suicide. Suicide is the only one where it's going up. So something is really wrong here. Okay, so I'm not gonna belabor this too much. We already, we heard earlier that we now have a problem, and this is huge in the suicide field. Um, we have a problem in the middle age group, and it was always the older white male that was our highest suicide risk group. That no longer is the case. So I, I put this out here for you because um, this is just looking at males and females, and we know that females uh, are much less likely to die by suicide. And the people who we see in our clinical practice who have borderline personality disorder are much more likely to be female. Um, but if you look at what is happening over the last few years, this is females only. 
And you could see in this, something is going on here, not just with middle-aged men, but also with middle-aged women, where the suicide rate in middle-aged women is going up. Um, and so we would expect that that might um, uh, translate into um, uh, an increase in suicide in borderline, too. So um, as a suicide researcher, one of the things that I always point out, this year, the 2014 uh, the firearm rate goes just below 50%, but um, in the United States, and this is particular to the United States, about half the people who die by suicide do by, die by firearms. It's incredible. And so when I talk about safety planning in a little while, we always talk about access to firearms. Um, okay, so this I think is really important for us to take a look at here. So um, this is, what is the, if you try to kill yourself with a firearm, what is the so-called success rate, the fatality rate? 85% of people die. If you do try to kill yourself by poisoning, which is drug overdoses, it's a much smaller uh, rate of death. So it's very hard to kill yourself by drugs, it's very easy to kill yourself by suicide. Men use guns, women use pills. Um, the other thing that I think is important for us to remember is the kind of like the, um, uh, the incidence of, su of substance use and, um, and suicide. And that's not, it's, it's not that um, so much that substances are used to die, but um, but substances are often on board at the time of death. In the, the highest incidence of substances at death is, um, is alcohol. So about a third of people who die by alcohol have, um, have who, who die by suicide have had alcohol before their death. This is particularly alarming. On um, 20, almost 21% have opiates on board. And this is probably going up with the increased use of, of opiates. Um, OK, so we already know this. I'm not going to go through all of these figures here. Um, there are um, many, um, many more males die by suicide. Females more often make suicide attempts. Um, and I, I won't go through all of these figures here. You have them in your uh, brochure. So do suicide attempts predict suicide? Um, and so if we, we look at this um, case in, um, in Europe where they looked at more than 21,000 cases, individuals who self-harm, and actually it's a little, uh, in the rest of the world, um, people don't separate out um, self, um, non-suicidal self-injury from suicide attempts typically. They lump self, all kinds of self-harm together. So people who self-harm are 24.7 times more likely to die by suicide. Um, so that's a pretty high, uh, high rate. But the thing that I think that's really important for us to think about, because as clinicians, when we're, when we're talking with people, um, there is a kind of a tendency to, to kind of like formulate in your head, okay, is this person at risk or not at risk? And so um, we, we pretty much know now that if somebody made a prior suicide attempt, we should be worried about them making another suicide attempt. However, um, over 50% of people who die by suicide have made no prior attempt. In other words, on their first attempt, they die. Um, and so it's, it, we can't rest easy, in other words, if, if we say, oh, well, that person doesn't have a prior attempt. They're not going to be at risk for suicide. Um, OK, so up to the 1980s, um, suicidal behavior was seen as a symptom of depression of borderline personality disorder, even though we didn't talk about borderline that much, of schizophrenia or substance abuse. In other words, um, suicidal behavior was looked at only in the context of a formal diagnosis. Um, and, um, and so the thinking was then, the way to treat suicidal behavior is you treat the primary disorder and the suicidal behavior goes away. Um, but actually, um, 
there was a, um, a change in perspective about this where we began to look at this in a little different way, where we saw, um, this is, and this is kind of what the current thinking is, that psychiatric disorder is a, um, is, is a necessary, but it's not a sufficient condition. And so we are trying to grapple with what is the other things that goes on here that makes psychiatric disorders not the only, what, what else do we have to look for? Um, and so the reason that we, we know this is not everybody who is depressed that dies by suicide or makes a suicide attempt or in fact is, that, is suicidal at all. Um, and so the, um, so the way that we have started thinking about this is um, we're kind of going in a direction and, and, and Joe's talk is kind of giving me pause about this and I'm gonna talk about this with a little bit of trepidation here with him in the audience. Um, but we're starting to think about um, suicidal subtypes, that one size doesn't fit all and the place that we're starting from is this. So um, I was lucky in a treatment study that we're just kind of wrapping up now. We, did, we decided to do ecological momentary assessment, which is you give somebody um, a, a little uh, uh, thing to carry around. Now we use an iPod. And they get pinged several times a day, and they fill out a bunch of ratings. Uh, and so we gave these to our patients, all of whom or have borderline personality disorder. We gave them to carry um, over the course of a week, six times a day they were pinged, and we looked at the character of their suicide ideation over the course of a week. So what is interesting about it is these patients all had borderline personality disorder. So I would have thought that this would be like what my borderline patients would be like. But in fact, that was not true. This is a subgroup of people with borderline personality disorder. And this is another subgroup. So you have people who have um, ideation that is all over the place over the course of a week. That's really tough. If you're thinking about clinically, they're up and then they're down, and then they're up and then they're down, and then what do you do with those patients? These were the people who, I, um, who go to the emergency room uh, and, and they convince, they try to convince the staff there that they're no longer suicidal. And often they get shipped off to a hospital, but in fact they are no longer suicidal because they're like this. Um, and then there is this other kind of subgroup. And so what we started thinking about is, OK, so how can we understand? So say this is really an important, meaningful difference in people. And we really can identify these, these highly variable from these not so variable. And so this is where I th we're supposed to be getting funded any minute now to look at these two suicidal subtypes. And so it's really, I we've we kind of have a sense of what this subtype is. So this is kind of more the, the reactive one, the one that goes up and down. So the stress responsive subtype. And in fact, we have data now that I'm not gonna show here that these people, um, we gave the Trier social stress test to these patients, which is you, it's, a, it's kind of, a, you put people um, in, um, in a room where they give, uh, they give a little bit of a speech and they, um, they do a backwards arithmetic test and then you get their cortisol levels over time. And so, um, and so you can look at their cortisol response over time. And in fact, what we found is these, the highly variable type, this one, had a much higher cortisol response to, um, to, um, um, to the stress than these guys. So, so we're looking at this kind of stress responsive, stress reactive subtype. And then we have played with what exactly is this one called? And so what it, I really think about it as kind of like the depressogenic subtype, the more chronic or the non-stress responsive. And this what is what we think about as um, having um, a more, uh, low serotonergic activity. So that's kind of where, that's just a little bit of kind of give you a taste of like where our research is going and what we're thinking about it. 
Um, okay, so now I'm just going to kind of switch back to talking about um, suicidal behavior in the context of borderline personality disorder, and then talk about strategies that we have for managing um, uh, people with um, suicidality. And you know, one of the things that's really interesting, the name of this conference is Suicidality, but from the CDC, it's a no-no to say suicidality, right? Um, and which I actually happen to really like that term because it really encompasses all of being suicidal. Um, okay, so nearly 10% of people with borderline personality disorder die by suicide. So the, the, the figures vary, um, and this is probably the upper limit of it. But it's a lot. And if you kind of go backwards and look at the universe of people who die by suicide, anywhere from 9 to 33% of individuals have borderline personality disorder. So these figures actually are not that great because a lot of studies do not include looking at access to. It just doesn't. And, and you still, I still have colleagues at Columbia who think that borderline personality disorder does not really exist, that if you treat the, the depression, the borderline personality disorder will go away. And, um, and this is actually, this is still, or it's a variant on, uh, on bipolar disorder, or it's some sort of atypical depression, something like that. Um, so, um, but the, it's pretty striking that if you, when you do look at studies that do um, look at access to diagnoses, um, there's a high rate of people who die by suicide. Um, for in borderline personality disorder, up to 70% of um, individuals with, um, with BPD have cut, burned, hit, or otherwise injured themselves. Um, Self-hitting is a very big problem. We often don't ask about it. Um, but um, people take objects and hit themselves in the head, or they hit themselves in the head, or they bang their heads against the wall. And then non-suicidal self-injury does, in fact, predict future suicidal behavior. So um, what's the problem of working with um, suicidal behavior in the context of borderline personality disorder that's a little bit different, say, than in, in depression? Um, so suicide attempts occur at a much higher rate than suicide, about 10 times as many attempts for every suicide. It's probably even a higher rate in BPD than in any other diagnosis. Um, the usual method of attempt um, in BPD is overdosing. So what happens is the high rate of attempts and the chronicity of suicide ideation in the borderline population makes for a very complex picture and difficulties assessing and managing risk. So even, for example, when to hospitalize or not hospitalize, when to send to the emergency room or not to. And this is what you know we think about as the boy who cried wolf phenomenon. And it's actually not faking it. But I think that the clinician who is treating the person with borderline personality disorder who is suicidal kind of takes that frame of mind that, well, they, they say they're suicidal, they say they're suicidal, they say they're suicidal, and there's no attempt. Um, or they make a low lethality attempt, they make a low lethality attempt, that's all they're gonna do. And then they die by suicide. And so, but, so it's this kind of figure ground thing that is very difficult in the context of borderline personality disorder of, you know, you have, um, you have kind of like a high base of suicidality, suicide ideation, suicide attempts, and low lethality attempts. And then how do you know when it's going to be um, either a suicide death or a very serious attempt? And so the, the picture tends to lead to an underestimation, I think, of suicide risk and may, and may in fact contribute to the high risk of completion. And so this is kind of a, a, um, a, a poor explanation of this. They're trying to figure out whether it's a chemical thing or I'm just a crybaby. And I think that's what happens to a lot of people with borderline personality disorder. They, it's not real. It's, it, whatever it is, it's not real. And, um, and, and so the, we tend to kind of like underestimate or um, undervalue the, the role of this is in fact real. Um, okay, non-suicidal self-injury in BPD, it occurs at a high rate. 
um, there is a big overlap between people who self-injure and the group who make suicide attempts. Um, and so there is some thinking about this that you know maybe there is a kind of like a gate theory that um, once you start one kind of self injurious behavior that it, it, it allows you to move to uh, another level of self injurious behavior. Um, also common, as I mentioned before, are uh, self hitting, <coughs> head banging, and skim picking. So. One thing that I think is interesting in suicidal behavior and borderline personality disorder that can be a little bit different than suicidal behavior in, uh, say, in major depression. Often individuals with, with BPD um, describe their suicide attempts in the same kind of way uh, as self-injury episodes. And it is a kind of a, a, a thing that then people tend not to believe that they were seriously suicidal. Um, and um, uh, and so um, suicide attempts in this kind of strange way, in the same way that self-injury serves as a emotion regulation function, suicide attempts can serve as a self-regulation function. And we really don't pay enough attention to this. And this really takes me back all the way to my internship out at... Um, uh, at LIJ on Long Island, where um, I came into my supervisor and I said, like, I don't understand. This was the time when they, a very long time ago, they had still had cottages there that were not locked. Um, and so somebody came in and um, he had made a suicide attempt and with a serious suicide attempt, and within a week, he was the president of the patient governance board. And I said, I went to my supervisor and I said, like, I don't understand this. And she said, oh, that's just shallow depression. And so it's like, okay, it's shallow depression. Actually, it was borderline personality disorder. Um, and so whatever the attempt, whatever the function of the attempt was, it served to kind of stabilize the person. Um, and so, I mean, I won't get into it, but then there is a question of what is the underlying neurobiology? What's happening in the context of, uh, and I have some research where I've looked at this in non-suicidal self-injury. What's happening when somebody self-injures? This is not like, oh, it's just a learning function and we learn how to do it. Something, we are biological animals. Something is happening to us biologically when we self-injure that is making us feel better. What is that? Um, and so the same thing kind of is happening often, not all the time, in people with borderline personality disorder. Okay, so um, the thing I think that is really important is that in our minds, we often, now probably not in this audience, but in a general clinical audience, I think we walk around with a model of suicidal behavior as kind of thinking about suicidal behavior uh, as a aspect of major depression. The depressed individual goes into a protracted period of depressed mood, hopelessness, withdrawal, and isolation, and it can culminate in feeling life is not worth living, feeling hopeless, and then lead to a suicide attempt. Following the attempt, if you've spoken with people who have major depression, every now and then somebody is glad that it wasn't successful. Often people talk about feeling sorry that it wasn't successful. But the major depression model doesn't seem to apply to suicide attempts in BPD. We try to apply it, and it leads us to the notion that the BPD individual feels better afterwards because the attempt was just manipulative. It was not really genuine. It was designed to get attention. And we just have to kind of move out of that model and not think in that model at all. Um, this is an example, I won't go through this. This is a typical example, you have it in your, um, your handout of somebody um, who made a pretty serious suicide attempt. So if we compare um, suicidal behavior in BPD and borderline personality disorder, some of the questions we can ask is does it have a different phenomenology? Are the after effects of suicide um, attempt in BPD different? Yes, often people feel better. Is the behavior less serious? 
Um, do the precipitants differ? And is there a different bio biology? Okay, so this was a study um, that Beth Brodsky and I did a while ago. If you look at people who um, have, have borderline personality disorder, they, have, they start their career of suicidal behavior earlier. They have more suicide attempts at a, any given age. But it's really interesting if you look at like what's the most serious suicide attempt that they make, it's the same as major depression. So it isn't just like, oh, they just make a bunch of low lethality attempts, who cares? You know, it's not good, but it's not that serious. It is serious. Their lethality is exactly the same. They're just making more low lethality attempts. They have greater hostility, greater impulsivity, um, and greater uh, history of aggressive behavior. So that's a kind of a difference between the, the two. Um, and you know it's interesting because when we the the model of those two type types that I was talking about the two endophenotypes, they actually when we start to look at our data, you would think oh well maybe that's the borderline one and that's the non-borderline one, but that, it actually is not really true. Um, so you shouldn't just think that that reactive one is just borderline. Um, so if you think about interpersonal events as triggers for um, for suicide attempts. In the borderline, as we heard earlier today, in the individual with borderline personality disorder, much more often an interpersonal trigger. Um, and so for their first attempt, their most recent attempt, and their most lethal attempt. So the interpersonal, um, interpersonal interactions are very complicated uh, and stressful for individuals with BPD. Okay, so, so that kind of puts the context um, for um, how are people with borderline personality disorder different in terms of their suicidal behavior than other people? Um, so now, what, how do we help them? What do we do as clinicians in, in treating individuals with um, uh, BPD who are suicidal? So we have some suicide-specific psychotherapies. There's DBT, there's MBT, there's cognitive therapy for suicide prevention. But the reality is that many clinicians are not in the position to learn suicide-specific psychotherapies. You know, now that I have this role within New York State of developing and implementing suicide prevention trainings throughout the state, I see what clinics are uh, are tasked with and what their workload is and the number of patients and the variety of patients that they see. And so if I'm going around as the suicide prevention expert and say, you know what, you need to learn this specific therapy for your suicidal clients. It's like, you know, it's really, it's nice, but it's not realistic. Um, however, as somebody who has learned DBT and CT, um, you can kind of glean from that what are some of the things that we can do that can help suicidal people. And in fact, in one of my treatment trials um, where we were kind of doing, we were comparing DBT to um, clinical management, I found that certain kinds of clinical management techniques led to very low incidence of suicidal behavior. And that started us thinking of, okay, so what are those techniques? What are we doing here? Um, and so that's some of the things that I'm gonna talk about here. So, um, so, and I'll talk a little bit about each of these things. Explicitly inquire about suicide ideation. Now, you would think that that is a no-brainer, but it is not. And somebody mentioned earlier that people feel funny asking about it sometimes. And, um, and what happens is people assume that if it's not mentioned, it's not present. If in working with suicidal people, and this is very hard, often in clinical environments, but I'm just gonna say it, you need a, a flexibility in the clinical approach. I'll talk about that in a, in a moment. You need to, as the, like for me, I was in charge of my treatment study, so I could require documentation each and every time there was evidence of any suicide ideation of a collaborative plan for managing 
suicidality. Now, at the time, we hadn't developed the safety plan. Now we have this, this small intervention, but all I was asking the clinician to do was, each time your, your patient says to you, I, I'm having suicide ideation, I want the two of you to develop a plan together about how they're gonna manage it. Pretty simple, right? But it doesn't get done. Um, consultation with colleagues is extraordinarily important. Therapeutic stance, I'll talk a little bit about that. And then structuring techniques to maintain the focus on suicidality. So um, are there, do clinicians who have had a suicidal, uh, who have had a patient who has died by suicide learn anything from that experience? They, there are tremendous, terrible um, um, emotional sequelae of that for, for clinicians. So, um, so these results actually were shocking to me. These, this was not the intention of the article. The article talked about, um, about the, wh how the clinician basically felt the same uh, after a suicide of a patient as a, a family member did when, uh, when their loved one died by suicide. So, um, so these are the results that were surprising to me. So, about 75% of them assess their patient as suicidal. About, when you put these two figures together, about 50% of them had asked their patient about suicidality in their last appointment. And in retrospect, only about a third of them would have done anything different. So I'm thinking like, wait a minute, only half of them asked a person who they had known to be suicidal um, that about their suicidality, and only about a third of them would have done anything different. It's like, well, wouldn't you think that you would begin to start asking about suicidality? Um, so this is what we do. Um, we do ongoing, if you know you have somebody who has evidence of suicidality, we do ongoing monitoring of their suicidality. And that means can not assuming, if they're not talking about suicidal ideation, that they're not suicidal. We conduct an affirmative assessment of suicidal ideation. Um, and conduct a an affirmative assessment of recent suicidal behavior. So if you have, if you work with individuals with borderline personality disorder, you know that they can have made a suicide attempt a week ago, two days ago, come into your office and have zero suicidal ideation. So if you just say, Do, are you feeling suicidal now? Um, and they, they say no. You are missing, you could be missing something very big about not asking them about their recent behavior. Um, and in fact, I remember as we were developing the CSSRS, I was insistent on putting recent behavior on the screening form of it because if you, you can miss picking up somebody who is in a high risk period if you do not ask about recent behavior. This is especially true if you're working with borderline patients. Um, and so, um, I put up this up because this gives you a taste of me as a clinician. Refusing to discuss this is not an option. Um, and so if you are my patient, you are going to talk about this, period. You want to be my patient? I am a good clinician. Um, you, you have to be willing to talk about this. And there has to be this kind of level of kind of communication and trust that if I ask you this question, you will give me an honest answer. And so I'm, so my patients know that I am willing to tolerate a high level of suicidality without hospitalizing as long as I can trust their honesty. And these are like two very important dimensions that we have to take into account. I, and I, and I have this discussion very explicitly, and any, you don't need to be doing DBT, SHMEBT, NEBT to be able to do this. This is really important to, um, to establish when you're working with a suicidal person. Um, and so, um, 
and, and this happens a lot if you work with adolescents. You know, they, they don't want to talk about it, you know. Um, and so, um, so you have to establish a climate where they, um, they know that this is, it's not an option to not talk about it. So the other thing, when I say affirmative assessment, I mean affirmative assessment. You ask about it. Um, do not as assume that if patients do not express suicide ideation, if they're not, if they don't say so. Um, and patient after patient with borderline personality disorder, this is what I have the most experience with, so really is speaking from the place of working with individuals with borderline personality disorder. So I will say, hey, why didn't you tell the clinician about that? Well, I didn't think the clinician cared. Um, or the clinician doesn't want to hear about it, so he or she doesn't have to do anything about the risk. Because it is a big pain to have to deal with somebody who is suicidal. You have a, you know, I've, I've had it in my private practice where, you know, you're seeing patients one after another, and somebody says they're suicidal, and you feel like, okay, you know, I, I, I have decided that this person actually cannot leave now, that they are so extraordinarily suicidal, I cannot risk sending them home. Well, that kind of like, you know, that interrupts your schedule. And, um, and so you have to be able to kind of like own up to that, acknowledge that, and not act on, hey, I don't want my schedule interrupted. Um, and you know, the interesting thing is that if my schedule gets interrupted in the context of this, I never, of course, talk about it with the patients who are in the waiting room, but they all know why it got interrupted, and they all appreciate that I would do the same thing for them. Um, so, um, so you want to try to create a therapeutic environment that encourages um, uh, disclosure, and so I'll talk about that in a minute. So flexibility and approach. This is really tough for people who work in a clinic environment. Um, you, if you have, if you are working with a suicidal population, you have to provide for increased contact during periods of suicidal crisis. So you increase the number of appointments, you increase the intercession contact, either by phone or if you're comfortable with email. You can have patient check-in. My patients find this incredibly helpful. Um, they will call and leave me a message on my machine saying, you know, it's Sally. I, uh, I'm doing okay, or I'm struggling, but I'm okay. And they, and I, they don't need me to call them back. We, we know in advance. We've made a plan in advance. Um, and, and it works out fine. Um, and they, they know that somebody else knows how they're doing. And then you need to consider uh, options for other forms of therapeutic support. Hospitalization is always an option, but there are other options short of hospitalization. So, of course, there's groups and there's day programs, but one of the things that I work on with my patients is increasing your structure in your day. This seems pretty simple, but it's like, you know, you have somebody who comes into your office and who is, you know, basically getting out of their apartment, coming to their appointment with you, and then going back to there. It's like, no, that is not okay. Come up with a schedule of activities that you're going to do because we know that, number one, not having social contact is a, um, a likelihood to increase depression. And, um, and staying in your apartment or your home alone leads you to stay within your head and in your thoughts. And so, um, uh, so, uh, you, you, so you don't have to just think about sending somebody to a day program. You can work with them on increasing their structure. So clinician consultation and support are very, very important. I work at... Um, at New York State Psychiatric Institute, and it happens that in our division, along our corridor, everybody works on suicide. Um, we all, we do trials, we do biological studies, and, um, and so we're, we've seen hundreds of suicidal individuals. We are constantly knocking on each other's door, asking about, what do you think about this particular person? I'm worried. Do you think I should do this? Do you think I should do that? 
the person will often say, would you like me to talk with them? Do you want another, you know, or, or spend time? So it's really important. If you have um, a doubt in your mind, have some colleagues that you can consult with. You know, in DBT, we have a team and all, but if you're not doing DBT, you can still find a few colleagues that you can trust, that you can kind of swap support with and consultation with. Um, and all I can say is that experience helps. The more you work with suicidal people, the better you are at it, period. The more that you work with suicidal people, the less likely you are to hospitalize them um, because you have kind of a context and you have a feel for, it's like I collect um, Crocs uh, with blue designs. Um, these old, you know, from the 1700s, 1800s in America, they, you put, you know, uh, flour or um, uh, oil in these Crocs, carried them home with the cork on top of them. And so some of the Crocs have blue designs. If you um, have collected enough of these Crocs, looked at enough of these Crocs, you know which is a fake blue design and which is a real blue design. How does that happen? You know, I, you, you don't naturally know, oh, this cobalt blue, it looks this way and this way. It's from experience. So the more you work with suicidal people, the more you know, same as knowing which is a fake croc and which isn't. Um, okay, so this I wanna talk about for a minute um, is the therapist's dance. So um, it's, um, you have to come and working with suicidal people from a position of strength. You have to balance concern for the patient without being overly anxious. This is not so easy. And, and the, the, the reality is that I have worked, I have supervised some clinicians who actually, when you work with them and work with them, they actually shouldn't be working with suicidal people because they, they just don't have it in them. My daughter-in-law is going to be, is a surgeon. It's like, well, I could never in my wildest dreams be a surgeon. I can't stand the sight of blood. And so, um, so, but, so part of it is knowing yourself. And there are some people who just aren't made for working with suicidal people. That's okay. Um, I'm not really made for working with people who are just anxious. It's like, I just want to say, well, hey, stop that. There's nothing to be anxious about. But give me somebody who is cutting, burning, and acutely suicidal, and I know what to do, and I feel comfortable with that. So part of it is kind of, so in a clinic environment, you may not have this option. Um, but I, in, in a private practice environment, I think it's really important to kind of know yourself. Um, so the type of inquiry when you're asking about suicidality, people know if you are extremely anxious. It's matter of fact, but serious. And so there is this kind of like tension. You're asking this question about their suicide ideation and their suicidal behavior in the same way that you ask any other kind of question. Not more, not less. Um, therapists need to not worry too much, but um, and, 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 they ha and you have to develop a certain level of tolerance for suicidality. And so um, this really comes into play if you have established a relationship with a patient where they are honest. And so I can, have, I can tolerate your suicidality if I know you're being dead on honest with me. And so you need this kind of um, tolerance for a certain level of, of suicide, suicidality. So you hear it, you acknowledge it, you listen to it. It isn't like you don't pay attention to it. You say, I see you're feeling suicidal. And, you, and, and so that's balancing it with a sense of caring about the sui suicidality. So you care about it, but you're not going to go um, crazy about it, and you're not going to um, uh, act and hospitalize the person. This immediately. This is really important because the more that you are anxious and move to hospitalize, the, and you keep that person in your practice, the less likely they are to tell you about their suicidality in the future. I have patients who go to a particular uh, day program, and they say, well, I never tell 
the group about X, Y, or Z because I'll get kicked out. They have been taught. They've seen somebody get kicked out and they don't want to get kicked out. And so they, they don't disclose. But yet then they're walking around with this. And so as a therapist, we have to kind of walk this tightrope. And then you take a collaborative problem solving approach. Okay, so discuss in advance how the two of you will handle suicidal crises, develop a safety plan. I think that no suicidal patient should ever leave a first appointment without some rudimentary safety plan. So, you know, when you work in a clinic environment, you have a first appointment, how, how much, how thick is the stack of forms, well now it's on the computer, that you have to fill out? And so how important is it to get somebody's history of psychiatric hospitalization in that first appointment versus giving them a tool that they can leave with and possibly keep themselves alive till their next appointment? And so this is a tough sell to clinics um, and hospitals, but it's, um, but it, it's kind of a, to me, in my mind, it's a no-brainer. So when we talk about a safety plan, we really want to differentiate it from no suicide contracts. We kind of don't do sui no suicide contracts anymore. A no suicide contract asks a person to promise to stay alive without telling them how to do it. We think we can do better. Um, in New York State, we have adopted what we call this AIM model. Um, which is assess, intervene, and monitor. And, the, and this is what we talk about when we go to clinics. Like This is like your basic of suicide care. You assess, you do some sort of basic intervention, and you do some sort of follow-up monitoring. Um, okay, so I just want to talk for a little bit, I know I don't have a lot of time left here, about the safety plan intervention that my colleague Greg, Greg Brown and I developed. Um, Seth mentioned it um, earlier. We have data now supporting that um, we get a reduction in over a six month period of time um, by uh, about 45% in suicidal behaviors for people who have this. They have a higher rate of engaging in further treatment. Um, so it's a, it's a, um, it's a clinical in intervention that, develop, that results in a one page document to use when a suicidal crisis is emerging. Um, we are now doing it with a group from uh, Brown and uh, Michigan State in, um, for suicidal people in jails, and they are trying to implement this, um, Ed Boudreaux in, in, uh, at the University of Massachusetts is trying to implement this in emergency rooms. And actually the most difficult place to, um, to get this um, administered is in the context of emergency departments. Um, who um, say they don't have time to, um, to do this intervention. Um, okay, so, um, so what are the strategies that, um, that are in um, the safety plan? We, what we did was when we put the safety plan together, we went to the literature and we just looked, okay, what's the evidence base? What has some support in the literature for um, reducing suicide? And so we, uh, means restriction was one of them. Brief problem solving and coping, including distraction. I happen to be a huge fan of distraction in the context of a crisis. Enhancing social support is related to um, a, a, a um, uh, protective factor. Uh, of course, identifying an emergency context, and then a little bit of motivational enhancement for, um, for further treatment. So why a safety plan? So one of the things that we know is that even for my group that had relatively stable suicide ideation and people that went up and down, the actual period of risk for acting on a suicidal urge, and it's so interesting, in the field, we, don't, we talk about behaviors and we talk about ideation. We do not talk about urges. We talk about you know, urges to self-injure. Why do we not talk about urges for a suicide attempt? Um, because that's actually what people have. They do have urges. Um, and so the, the period of time where the urge is very strong is actually very limited. And so when you talk with people who, have, who go through these crises, um, they talk about kind of like white knuckling it through that period of time, like just kind of holding on till the urges pass. And so what we decided to do was give them something to do while the urge is happening. 
Um, and so the, the theoretical foundation, and this isn't like a small t, um, suicide risk fluctuates with time. Time is your friend if you are suicidal. And we really forget that. And that's why restricting access to means to firearms is so incredibly important. It's really important because um, if we get rid of that or put a distance between, why, why does that work? If somebody wants to go out and kill themselves, they can. But, the, but the, the reason is because suicidal urges pass. Um, problem solving capacity diminishes with, during crises, so over practice or a specific template can help. That's like um, during fire prevention week, um, my kids we used to come, we lived up on a hill, they would come, they would be rolling down the hill, it's like, oh, it's fire prevention week because they learn to stop, drop, and roll. And um, so why, why do, so we, we know that kind of like over-practicing, having a specific thing in the, when you're in an emergency situation is helpful. And so that's what the safety plan um, is about. And one of the things that I would have you remember is how many of you have had a patient come into your office once and never saw them again? So if that person is suicidal, wouldn't you like to give them something that they might be able to use when they, um, when they leave? So, um, so we just have, I'm going to just go through these. Um, uh, what are the steps? We, do, we have them recognize the warning signs. They can't um, know to use them a safety plan if they don't know when to use it. We have them, and we, this is a stepwise thing, and this comes from really kind of like trying to help shape behavior and from helping them learn. The more that they do this, the more they, um, they have the capability to manage their suicidal feelings. Um, and so the idea is that if they do this, do this, do this, that it will kind of become automatic, kind of like riding a bike. So we, we, for, we have them identify things they could do by themselves, people that they can use as distractions, who to contact that they, um, who can help them in a crisis. So you can see that in New York, I don't know what, if it's true up here, but in New York, everybody puts on their, um, their answering machines at work. Um, uh, if you are in an emergency, go to the nearest emergency room or call 911. It's like, actually, I think we can do better than that. You know, would, if, you have, if you have an anxious patient in your practice, would you say, um, you know, if you get, if we all think of, if you get suicidal, call me or go to the emergency room. If you, if, would you say to the anxious patient, if you get anxious, call me? No, you teach them skills. So that's the idea. We can teach people skills. Suicidal feelings are just like any other feelings. They're scarier. They result in uh, a horrible outcome. But they're just like any other feelings that can also be managed. So then we have them identify who their contacts are. So in other words, we as clinicians are not first on the list. If it's a real emergency and they feel like they can't handle anything, yes, of course, we tell them to, to contact them or go to the, near, the nearest emergency room. So then we also have them identify um, uh, what are their access to means, what would they use, what have they used, and we always talk about firearms. Um, this is an example of a safety plan. You can um, go to our website and download these forms. It's suicidesafetyplan.com. Okay, and then um, lastly, the only other thing that I'm going to mention here is using structure as a strategy for managing suicidality. Um, and the, the reason is that um, when you work with people with continual crises and continual stressors, you need to stay on the path um, where that, to help them with their suicidality, or you can get derailed. This is, often happens with borderline patients by moment-to-moment -moment crises. Um, okay, so these are structuring techniques. They are, in, in, they are in CBT or DBT, setting an agenda, conducting behavioral analyses, um, and uh, balancing validation with problem solving. Okay, so I... You have the other things in um, the, the description of these things in your um, pamphlet. I won't go through them in the interest of time here. Um, so just in conclusion, I will say, look, we have a problem in the United States um, with suicide. It's growing. 
we haven't tackled it yet. Suicidality in the context of borderline personality disorder has to be taken seriously. We cannot um, neglect it just because it occurs very often. And while suicide-specific psychotherapies have been developed, most clinicians will not be able to learn them. But we can all learn simple clinical strategies that can be used, even in the absence of suicide-specific um, psychotherapy training. And then I found this quote by Carl Menninger, hope is a necessity for normal life and the major weapon against the suicidal impulse. And um, my patients would describe me as an eternal optimist, or somebody once described me as stubbornly hopeful. And I think if you are a clinician working with suicidal individuals, you have to maintain that position of stubborn hopefulness. Um, and then I just want to thank my research team and all of my patients who have contributed to our research. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stanley, for an excellent talk. Um, we have several questions here. I'm going to go through a couple, and then we'll hold the rest for the panel. Um, is there any research on the effectiveness of the safety planning? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, did, I purposely didn't do a data talk today, um, but um, we, have, we have a lot of data on the acceptability and feasibility of it. Um, we have data now that it's, like, we have a parallel group design um, where we gave um, safety plans in the emergency department um, in the VA, and then we had a comparison group where they didn't get them, and that was the data that I referenced earlier where we have a 45% reduction in lower um, number of suicidal behaviors in the safety plan group. In addition, they're much more likely to engage in follow-up care. Um, we are now, we think we're going to be funded to do a, a straight up randomized control trial, which we've been trying to do. Um, but because safety planning has become so broadly accepted, it's been hard to get that trial funded. Uh, but we think that it's really important to really just look at its efficacy alone in an RCT. Thank you. Um, how would you suggest that clinical staff help determine lethality in the kind of boy who cried wolf cases that you were mentioning, um, and and how can they kind of protect themselves legally when when? Uh, uh, what was the last part? How can they protect themselves or colleagues legally if they determine that the patient is not really a high risk? Um, gosh, I mean, um, legally, you uh, I mean, you, you always take a risk, and I don't know that it's. Um, uh, and I, I'll put aside the, the, the malpractice kind of thing, which I gather is what you're talking about. Um, you know, it's, um, as I said, the more that you work with suicidal people, the more you kind of get a feel for it, the more you have established a, an open and honest and trusting relationship. Um, and that comes uh, in a, uh, a bed of having patients feel comfortable talking about their suicidality with you, um, and knowing that you won't just neglect it, but also knowing that you won't overreact to it. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, it's one of these things, it's really a kind of a, a fine clinical distinction that you, you have to make. And, um, uh, and the other thing is, uh, what I would say is that if somebody is suicidal and, and their suicidality is increasing, I increase my monitoring and my contact. So it isn't like I say, oh, I get that you're, you're feeling suicidal, but you're not that suicidal so that you need to be hospitalized. It isn't like an all or none thing. It's like, okay, you're feeling suicidal, your suicidality has escalated. What can we do to help you manage the suicidality now? Then we'll do another check-in and see if it's lower. And then again and again. And so um, I, I think that that's pretty protective. I have, I have a safety plan. I have a plan for monitoring. Um, and um, I've never been sued. <laughs> and I've never had anybody who's, who's died by suicide. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Stanley. We'll revisit the rest of the questions at the panel, but thank you.